Nordic Rebels Season 3, Skills for the Future. Um, when was the last time you actually checked you know, these lists telling you what kind of skills you need for the future? So you need creativity, analytical thinking, interdisciplinary knowledge, emotional intelligence, leadership skills, technology skills, skill skills, the lists, they just go on. But is it really about like ticking the boxes or establishing something long term, something more positive or something actually that changes in your body? That's what season three is going to be all about. So enjoy First the ride. All right, so this is, as we said, as I said, a way of structuring how you observe the world and a way of, you know, elaborating a bit on your thoughts on, you know, when you observe something in the world, like how do you think about it? How do you um, adopt a, a mindset that is more future oriented? So that's what we're going to talk about. So something I read this morning, something I noticed was that a lot of the political news we're seeing right now are communicated with memes. Mm -hmm. So I did read uh, longer articles, I even heard, um, heard some radio this morning uh, and all the political news um, were on there. But then at the same time, I went to Instagram and saw a couple of memes that were communicating the same news. Um, and I think that's quite interesting because let's try and use this model to analyze this observation of mine and you're going to help me do this with right. your insights. So the observation is political news are being communicated with memes alongside the regular regular news of course. Also we use memes to understand them, maybe to ridicule them, to put perspective on for example this morning when Donald when I read that Donald Trump had visited uh, North Korea and I saw this as a meme. Um, so that's the observation. Um, and then if we use this model, uh, we have to now think about what are the implications of this news being communicated, political news being communicated with memes. Like for once, uh, one implication could be like it reaches more people um, faster because not everyone reads the paper, not everyone listens to morning radio and so on. So it might reach people faster. Do you have? Any yeah. other ideas for implications? I mean, the biggest difference, I think, and this is why people like memes, is because they are relatable. They yes. already they speak to you on different kind of levels at the same time. They speak to a context where the original meme already has some emotions into it involved. Mm -hmm. It uses sarcasm or different levels of communicating as well. In a way, it's more focused as well. Because uh, if we take an article for, from a journalist, they obviously try to stay unbiased. Mm -hmm. Memes have a very specific meaning. Yes. Although uh, they have a specific message to get out there. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's interesting and dangerous as well, I just it's, it's quite. It's, both the it's definitely both opportunities and threats in here. So if we follow the model yeah, as along with this um, implications, are, yeah, it might reach more people. It's very direct faster. communication, faster, definitely. And it's also a very direct communication of what does the source think about this political thing that happened. It's very easy to decode, at least for uh, a lot of people who spend a lot of time on the internet, on meme pages and so on. So. Um, opportunities first, um, as we said, reading news, reading people faster, um, more accelerated. Um, if we try and you know put our minds to what opportunities as for well, this, uh, you receive more confirmation from the people around you. Sure. You, if there are two memes for two different kind of messages at the mm -hmm. same time, and then you have those upvotes and downvotes already in uh, in those uh, in the spreading of the of the memes and yes. the social networks, for example. So whoever is posting it is also receiving instant feedback, of course, either if it's like an individual person or if it's uh, a news site and so on. That's true. Maybe it's all... No, I'm sorry. And de developing out of this, there's uh, way more communication about it. Mm -hmm. Because suddenly people, they actually discuss 
in this comment section about yes. all, all those topics, right? They're doing it already in the news agencies, uh, and on the new, beneath the news articles, mm -hmm. but now since there's a new group of people being reached by it, yeah. uh, you kind of integrate plus uh, or below 15-year-old uh, people in that kind of big of a topic. Yeah. True. So, yeah. so um, moving on to threats, because uh, there's lots of opportunities definitely mm. in communicating pretty difficult geopolitical yeah. um, situations in a one single meme. Um, threats are little, uh, maybe they're also obvious because um, it, it might be it might simplify some of the geopolitical issues that we are dealing with by making fun of a serious piece of news too soon, like it could be too soon that we're not even talking about what are the actual dangers of this situation happening before we start making mm. fun of it. That's one of the first things that come to my mind. Um, what also the spread of fake news, of course, if people trust, I don't know if they trust the memes of political news or if they just laugh at them and then brush them off and never think about them more. It's like a superficial way of um, Communicating news, do you have any thoughts? The level of quality is, I think the question of quality with those memes is mm. very important because it disappears kind of. If there is not a high quality, mm. quality way of creating those memes, then suddenly a meme that is created by user X epsilon, mm -hmm. uh, XY is on the same level as of uh, one of the biggest news agencies yeah. using that meme. So Maybe one of the implications or the opportunities again going, we can go definitely go back in the model is that um, in journalism school, they have to have a course on communicating in memes or something. Then it could be qualified, as you said, it could be quali qualified. But is, is it also, it could be also talking down to people, um, maybe a little bit communicating something that is fun. Maybe um, you said it's okay to go mm. back sometimes. Yes. Uh, if we don't use memes as an alternative for the journalist article mm -hmm. and more as an alternative for the thumbnail picture, mm -hmm. as an alternative for the capture mm -hmm. that is, or the headline. So the headline already is kind of, already just has the goal of giving someone a fast impression and creating awareness, right? Yeah. So the meme actually, instead of having just the headline, which is for giving the wrong idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to repeat this because that was awful. That's what, um, but that's what, that's what cutting is for. <laughs> yeah. So right now, what headlines are being used for is just to create the biggest awareness, and mm -hmm. sometimes they c create a complete different uh, impression of what mm -hmm. the article is about. A meme action, because just having a one-liner only mm -hmm. has so much potential in putting out the real message. Mm -hmm. But a meme, on the other hand, actually since it has so much more dimensions than a headline, it actually has a better way of capturing the actual truth of the article. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think you're perfectly right. But okay, this just shows that I saw a meme this morning and mm. then we have an actual discussion that involves both implications and opportunities and threats, which is important because it just helps nuance the way we look at implications. So basically every change, like every little change we're observing, if it's political communication or lots of other things, it can be evaluated this way. So let's talk about another example that I want to discuss with you. Um, it's how I notice that more and more people I know, um, and I've seen more and more advertisement for, for them, but there's more and more people I know that are using mindfulness apps and, mm. and, and apps to help them meditate and apps that help people fall asleep. Uh, and I think it's a quite interesting development because it comes with the gadgets that we're using. Everyone has an iPhone now yeah. and it's a tool for helping us with basically everything, even relaxing and falling asleep. But it's when something's becoming mainstream, it's quite good to maybe analyze it in this nuanced sort of very futuristic uh, way. So the observation is more and more people use apps to help them fall asleep. Um, as uh, meditate and fall asleep at night. So implications, I think one is pretty straightforward and that is more people might fall asleep faster uh, or Mental have health. better sleep. Better health is definitely an implication. Um, have you, do, have, do you have any to add to this? Yeah. Um, if we, I think for me, a different obvious uh, implication of it is 
since we now use technology to help us on a such personal level, mm -hmm. the boundary that we have there gets less and less, we break it down. So we are suddenly open for using additional gadgets. Yes to uh, coordinate, monitor our sleep. So suddenly it's okay if, uh, I think if Facebook would start a, a bracelet that tracks my sleep, yeah. I probably would have been scared of receiving commercials in my mind, uh, my dream. So but now, <laughs> oh, uh, since You're I definitely getting into this uh, way yeah. of uh, thinking about implications, yeah. yes. But uh, if I first start to use an app mm -hmm. uh, where that just tracks my off time and maybe even the time I'm sleeping, uh, even connected to my alarms. I'm so much more open because now I started thinking about what mm -hmm. kind of possibilities are in there. So now I start thinking about, okay, maybe I'll get a bracelet because I think a good friend of mine actually got herself a bracelet and started tracking her sleep. And out of this, she suddenly started to change her behavior throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And she has different priorities. And suddenly she's more concerned about her own, uh, let's call it personal health, mm -hmm. than about the question of how much data is gathered right now. And yes. her profile definitely is uh, connected to her Google account. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. lots of data has been gathered. But this is, this is interesting because we're moving into opportunities and there's definitely opportunities uh, in simply better health. And health is actually, f a focus on health is actually a mega trend for us. Like there's gonna be more and more focus on health and this is why we have uh, both huge companies and small startups working towards something that will help people get better health. And this is, all, this is also works along with the, we're accepting the idea of the quantified self that you're describing, mm. that we are gathering more and more data or c companies, big and small, are, and government are gathering more and more data on individuals, uh, both in order to help us sleep better, which is, you know, what they, um, which is the, the most, um, one of the most obvious ways all this data can help us, but yeah. it also, it posed some, some threats definitely with more and more data on health issues and so on, uh, being both owned by huge companies and maybe also you know, owned by government, depends what region of the world you're living in. More and more um, very, very private data and health data particularly are um, being collected by all of these apps and gadgets that we're using for something, as you said, something is private and your off time, such as sleep. Um, that is something I, I don't worry about it, but I see it if not dealt with, it needs to, it, we need to, we, we are messing ourselves 24 hours a day. It must be, we also, we are, we are also very good at questioning this. We are very, uh, people are critical towards uh, gathering of data and so on, but still we very uncritically download all these apps and we, uh, I said there was a study very uh, recently in America where um, on a an American university campus they asked uh, students there if they would give up three email addresses of their friends they'd get a, f they'd get a free pizza and uh, I think it was I don't remember how many but three fourths or, some, or something like there's a huge number of the students that were asked to give to give up three email addresses for their friends uh, to get a free pizza. Like a, a huge percentage of these students that were asked, they just did okay here. And then this study concluded that people would give up some, something really private and personal, even their friends' personal data for free pizza. Um, then, you know, privacy is lost in the future. I'm not sure that I completely agree with that conclusion because I have to say, if I was asked, um, I just make up three addresses and because I don't think they check them. I mean, come on, students, most students would maybe maybe make up uh, three email addresses and then get the free pizza or something. There's a way to get about this. But one of the conclusions was that people give up free information and even their friends' information and data for a little bit of treat, a little something that lasts very short. But there's definitely with the, um, like the original observation mm. here, there's plenty of discussion on both quantified cells, privacy and data, and also definitely opportunities. I think um, definitely lots of threats, and it's easy to talk about the threats here, but the opportunities I think are equally important. If it could give people better sleep, better health, um, more s sense of safety mm. when we're home, mm. better at meditating, um, maybe we could become happier people if more people meditate and so on. So there's definitely lots of nuances to this little observation. It's spreading out in this what I, uh, discussion. What I especially like about this approach is mm. 
usually when you just have this conversation, right? Mm. When you just talk about a new trend and you're maybe in a business meeting or just with friends, you usually follow this mm. very instinctive, instinctive yeah. uh, conversation. But here, you have the po since you have the possibility <laughs> to always go back, yeah. you actually can try to adapt the opportunities in a way that the threats are uh, excluded, right? For example, yes. uh, what I liked about the last example you brought up is it touched upon the fact that we might, A, not be aware of how much data we give away, but mm -hmm. B, are actually quite cautious about uh, the possibility to trick the system in that sense, right? True. Um, what I thought about uh, in the sleeping example mm -hmm. was, was we suddenly get dependent on this uh, sleep awareness apps, right? Mm -hmm. So if they make an implication for us, if they recommend maybe go to sleep at that certain amount of time, and we think that that has implication mm -hmm. uh, on our mental health, we suddenly trust a private company with uh, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So there need to be, and so this is a threat, but if we think about what is necessary in order to exclude this threat, then there's a personal education sure. aspect of, out of it, maybe even uh, re official regulation. Mm -hmm. So suddenly we can go back to the opportunities and create stronger opportunities. Strong, like something to act upon, like actual actions to take in order to have the greatest advantage of this app. True, yeah. So and by that you kind of strong arm as well mm -hmm. the differentiation that you have in com as a competing advantage, yeah. right? So. That yeah. is a very interesting way of approaching those ideas. Yeah. We could talk about some examples more and you can choose if you want. No, mm. okay. looking at you, you're you focused on yeah. filming. Yeah. Cut. Yeah. How much? <laughs> Cut. Right. <laughs> um, so, for in order to have this global scanning network that we have um, in the database, we want as many and as diverse observation, uh, observations as possible. We have about 4,000 observations now, and the important, important thing about these observations, to me, it is that it's observations that I wouldn't notice, that observations that wouldn't be on my daily horizon, on my daily radar when I read and stuff. So I actually make sure to have a lot of include a lot of people in the network which have very different backgrounds from me. For example, there's an architect from India, and there's a designer from South Africa, and there's a political journalist from Sao Paulo and Brazil. And all of these people from diverse backgrounds have a different uh, radar than I have. They both have a different educational background that makes make sure that they're looking at different media than I am. And of course, um, they have different geographical positions, which means that they are exposed to different news and different priorities in news than I am. And this means, for example, that the architect in India, she had an observation on how India was changing its drone regulations. And uh, this is actually a very important piece of change that's happening because it has potential, potentially huge impact for Denmark and for the Nordics and everywhere else. So what's happening is they're loosening regulation on commercial drones, like they're um, making, making it easier to, have to be a company and use commercial drones in India. It could, be, it could deliver food, it could deliver medicine, it delivers organs even, like yeah. there's all kinds of delivery. Um, and this is needed in India where they don't have the same logistics infrastructure that we have. So they're doing like what is called a leapfrog, leapfrogging, which they're skipping uh, having an entire postal system that works perfectly because they're just skipping to the next technology that's going to solve the same problem. And so what is, what is happening is if India has a very well functioning, innovative system uh, of a drone ecosystem, they're going to be way ahead of our very regulated world. And there's nothing wrong with our world being very regulated when it comes to commercial drones, because it would be also more complicated to allow commercial drones here in Denmark. Um, but they're going to be way ahead of us in thinking about and using and getting used to having a drone infrastructure way before we did. Another example of someone who did this uh, is 
lots of um, African countries had mobile pay, had different kinds of mobile money connected to the tele telecommunications companies before we did. Like the idea of paying with your phone was um, very prominent in many sub-Saharan yeah. African countries before it was in the West because they lacked the infrastructure of banks. They wouldn't trust their banks. So they did this leapfrogging moment where they skipped a step in development or something. They skipped an infrastructure. So they, instead of making bank and institutions that they trusted, they knew they already trusted the telecommunications company. So they just made sure they could pay with their phones and they, through their tele telecommunication companies because they trusted them. They didn't trust the bank. So they also, uh, the idea of paying with your phone was really widespread there before it was here. So it could be the same in India mm. with the drones. Uh, but this is just an example of how the future is is already here in weak signals. There's small little changes of signals, signals of change from the future yeah. that we can, if we pay attention to these signals of change, we will see um, change and implications, opportunities and threats coming from far ahead. Um, and we can use this in, you know, everyone can use this in the daily yeah. works and also in the daily, uh, the way they go about themselves. As we spoke about before, um, lots of huge cities had the electric scooters long before Scandinavian countries did. And they did transform micromobility in France and in Brazil and so on before it transformed micromobility in the Nordics this summer. Uh, which has meant that France are regulating, um, or Paris, for example, is regulating electric scooters a lot more than we have been thinking about, because they were everywhere. And they are not very sustainable. They have an average lifespan, this tiny little scooter, of yeah. 28 days. It's insane. Um, so they're regulating now. They're having specific parking places where you can pick up and drop off the scooters and so on. They're already taking these steps that we potentially, in the Nordic countries, are going to take in a few months or it's necessary. But by looking at this change from Paris, like these are the necessary steps you have to take from these micro, uh, these scooters coming into our urban life. We could look at them now and be inspired, maybe starting to think about what, what regulations would we like to have and so on. So this is how you use these uh, weak signals or these signals of change this is how you observe them and think about them in a structured way and then always go back to what does it mean for me? I think it's really helpful for everyone, both maybe even friend groups as the smallest unit, like you and I or someone else. We should have, say like every two months we get together and we discuss really openly uh, and no boundaries, no limits, no no one's ashamed of saying anything and we discuss something that we think could potentially have uh, implications and the one of the so we both need the space uh, to talk about the future space where now it's allowed to you know yeah. think about the ideas and then we need the language and the structured way of doing it because most people uh, make the observation and then they either see the opportunities and the threats and the line of thinking stops there so in order to really adopt a uh, futuristic, uh, fut um, like a mindset that is very future oriented. You need to have all of these included in the way you talk about them. So the space that you know helps you talk about the future, or that allows you to talk about the future. It's, you know, uh, time frame now, crazy ideas, brainstorm, and then this universal language that helps you talk about the future, where it's not just fears and hopes or opportunities and threats that you're focusing on, but actually thinking about a change that is potentially coming and potentially will have a lot of uh, impact and implications. So what are opportunities and threats and how do we adapt and what actions do we take uh, as a friend group or as a um, board in a huge housing committee, as a huge logistics company or, you know, any other company I can think of. Yeah. And If you end up with threats mm -hmm. that you might just, since the last thing you talk about is kind of negative, yes. is there anything that, did, or your, what does your experience say if the last thing you talked about is negative? We've been running the database for five years now mm -hmm. and we've gathered uh, 4,000 different reports in the database and they're really very varied. I do think there's quite a, an even balance of observations that where people tend to focus on 
positive outcomes or uh, opportunities, and then fifty and then an even balance towards people also focus on focusing on threats, because that's the way. For example, people in the database that are urban planners are very good at you know thinking forward and thinking about opportunities for. Uh, we're we going to have rising seawaters levels. Like, how can we utilize this for the city? And how can smart cities make um, make life in cities better? They're very good at thinking about opportunities. How can we transform cities to make, make life in cities better? And how can we take um, these consequences of climate change that are happening and make them into a good thing? But then there's um, other groups of people, which I have to say most of them are probably sociologists or something, uh, social sciences, uh, as myself, we are prone to thinking of something in terms of being the threats where we lean towards um, thinking about the threats first, like, oh, corporation is taking over, data privacy is gonna, you know, I don't know, doom us all, like, that's, mm -hmm. that's our way of thinking, but now I'm completely, totally um, having prejudice towards my own uh, scientific background. But there seems to be in this database of 4,000 4, observations that there's a 50-50 uh, leaning towards opportunities and threats. So uh, I think we depend on who you're talking to and what the observation is, we can switch it around. And just making sure, that's the important thing, making sure that you think about uh, an observation in a nuanced way. And no matter, uh, even um, one of the potentially most difficult things to talk about is, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, more plastic pollution, pollution in the ocean. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's something that everyone would consider a huge threat. But then this model will force people to think about it. Okay, so what are the opportunities of plastic, more plastic waste? And there's almost no opportunities here. It's not really a framework, it's more a way of thinking about things, right? Yes, but it, it, can, it can also help individuals prepare you perfectly right. But first of all, it's a mindset that you adopt and I think it's beneficial to both companies, but definitely also beneficial to individuals to teach yourself. And it's a learning by doing thing. You need to do this, maybe write it down, maybe talk to your friends at least 10, 20 times before you adopt this mindset of thinking of, um, of change in a nuanced way. It's, it's difficult. It took me years, I have to be honest. And I'm not a particularly fast learner, but someone will be, maybe pick it up uh, faster. But it's a mindset that is very beneficial for individuals to adopt because it will nuance your thinking, which is great for any analysis you're doing. If you're just writing a paper, if you're having a political debate with your mom, it's very, very, it's a huge advantage to be able to see, see things and see change from, from several sides and several nuances. But it, um, that's one thing. Adopting this future-oriented mindset is good for almost everyone. Mm. Also, it can help you prepare, as you briefly mentioned, for what actions sh should you take. Uh, maybe you can highlight a little bit on what is the difference between thinking like this mm -hmm. in comparison to thinking maybe more traditional ways about the yes. future. Yes. Yes. So. Potentials. Yes, thank you. Potentials of this uh, for the individual is that um, uh, adopting this mindset, future-oriented mindset, can just help you adapt a little, quick, a little quicker to societal change. Maybe it'll help you, maybe it'll make it easier for you to choose what political party to vote for next time because uh, you are better at viewing things from both sides, and you're better at you. You're better at evaluating things. You're better at seeing change coming, which I think is important to everyone, young and old. Mm -hmm. you, you maybe become better at seeing change coming because when you're when you're observing the world this way with this mindset, you also notice things that you wouldn't have noticed before, like things that seemed insignificant, for, as, uh, drones in India, new drone legislation for commercial drones, or uh, cryptocurrency in Kenya, or 
um, any or small observations yeah. uh, that meal seemed box. or um, like meal boxes becoming more popular in Brazil, things that seemed insignificant before, if you put it into this formula and think about it with this mindset, you mm. You start noticing the world a little differently, and you start um, observing the world differently, thinking about the world differently. I think that's healthy for all of us. Navigating in a very increasingly complex world, it's good to have just a few tools to help you digest all the community, all the information we're constantly, uh, we're constantly, uh, you know. Uh, constantly getting from every media we own. It's just, a, it's just a little tool to help you navigate the world. So if you have a company or if you want to do a startup at one point, it's a good way to see where's the need mm. um, and where's an opportunity. A need can also be a threat, like it could be a future threat that needs to be dealt with somehow, an action you need to take and create, make into an opportunity. Yeah. So it's a business idea for someone if they really deal with it. And uh, But definitely it's about viewing societal change and technological change that are now intertwined, uh, very nuanced, because I, I do think it's a condition of a very complex, accelerating the complex world yeah. we all live in. Um.